ओके थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर अनुज फॉर द काइंड वर्ड्स शल आई स्टार्ट नाउ देन आई विल जस्ट शेयर माय ओके आई विल जस्ट गो अहेड एंड शेयर माय स्क्रीन is it uh, visible yes we can we can see it okay sure uh, so i think i'll go ahead and start are we good to start yes 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 we can okay so good evening everyone uh, today uh, i'll be talking about international uh, fellowship in ophthalmology and to do or not to do so first of all hi i am adweta um like uh, dr anuj already said i'm from calcutta i did my vr fellowship from sn chennai and you know that was my initial plan uh, i had just wanted uh, to do uh, i wanted to become a retina specialist but uh, at the most i had thought about doing maybe an observership so i had cleared my fico during residency but it all changed during my retina fellowship i saw so many retinoblastoma patients and uh, i did want more uh, oncology exposure and like dr soni said uh, we do not have an ocular oncology fellowship in, uh, in india it's usually clubbed with oculoplasty so i applied to canada to uh, university of toronto and i also applied to wills eye hospital in us and i was accepted at both the both the places so um but i chose to go ahead with canada and uh, i do not regret the decision so by the end of today's presentation i hope you will have an idea about why i chose to do a fellowship how i went about it and why i chose canada over us so we'll mainly be talking about uh, you know i'll start off by giving you a brief overview about the types of uh, fellowships how to go about applying uh, yourself and uh, the ideation process is basically how to take an idea from contemplation to completion then why should you do a fellowship if at all when to do it country wise opportunities and uh, the advantages of doing a fellowship um there will be a lot of uh, uh, you know data but at the end i'll give a handout which has a lot of important links and websites and free resources so you can just uh, take the handout at the end of the talk so starting off with the different types we all know we have observership which is just uh, like a short term where you are kind of a passive participant you just observe both clinical and surgical uh, processes but you don't take an active clinical role uh, research fellowship is the second type of fellowship and uh, i have divided it into two uh, different types so we have a basic science research fellowship um and this is where you do a core science research usually it will be in a lab and it will be uh, something like say aqua humor uh, dynam aqua humor aqua humor dna in retinoblastoma or molecular genomics in amd and stuff like that the other one is the one which we are familiar with that is clinical research fellowships um these are kind of like an extended observership i would say as uh, you have clinical exposure but the patient uh, contact is often limited and you definitely do not have any surgical privilege and these are available abroad in all the and these are commonly available for indian fellows in all the universities abroad now the one which is what we all covet is the clinical fellowship which is uh, you have both clinical and surgical privileges and uh, unfortunately this is the one that is hardest for uh, indian medical graduates to get so starting off with observership i think uh, the easiest way to apply is directly just write to the institute of your choice and uh, just tell them the amount of time you want to go there for but remember that you have to be able to fund your whole trip and the other thing is most of the hospitals nowadays also charge their own fee which is like a per month or a per week uh, amount and it's uh, quite a bit so i think uh, the better option might be to apply through one of these two organizations either ico or ioff which offer three month fellowships and they give around 6000 us dollars um fico exam so it's preferable that you have passed the exams but remember it's not mandatory so you can still apply even if you haven't given fico if you're a female i would recommend applying through ioff 
because uh, their website mentions that uh, females are encouraged. So I assume they give some kind of preference to young females from developing countries. Next, moving on to the basic science uh, research fellowships. Now, like I said, this is core research. So you should only apply for this if you're really, really serious about research. And again, uh, this might be a better choice for uh, those who are eventually uh, planning to permanently settle outside because the scope of uh, doing research work is often better in uh, better abroad. And you can just become a clinician scientist there for those maybe who want to go to US and not give USMLE. Um, the research fellowships, ICO offers a research fellowship that is for a year. Uh, you have 50,000 US dollars as funding. Uh, IOFF offers one for six months with 14,000 euro funding. And you can also apply to through APAO or the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology. And uh, they give you 1,000 USD for airfare and then 200 USD per month. Now, to apply for each of either of these, you need to have a research proposal. That is, you need to have a plan as to what you research, do your research on. And uh, it's preferable if you have done some research already in that uh, topic. Moving on to the clinical research fellowships. Um, ICO offers a six month retinoblastoma fellowship, and it also offers a one year ocular genetics fellowship, which is a very good one from what I've heard. It's at the National Eye Institute, NIHUS. Um, IOFF and APAO offer a few clinical research fellowships. Remember, these are the fellowships where you have limited clinical exposure, uh, but no surgical uh, privilege. And uh, I would recommend these only for uh, streams with very which are not hands-on heavy, you know, for example, medical retina, neuro-ophthalmology, ocular pathology, and stuff like that. But uh, I, it wouldn't uh, probably do well to do a research fellowship in vitro retina. Moving on to the clinical fellowships, uh, that is, these are the fellowships where you have full surgical privilege. Only a few countries uh, give full surgical privilege to Indian pass outs. And these are UK, Canada, Australia, and Singapore. Uh, we will uh, talk about these countries later in detail. Um, IOFF also offers surgical fellowships, but only in Peru and China. And APAO offers uh, surgical fellowships in New Zealand, Singapore, and a limited surgical fellowship in UCLA, USA. Now, keep checking uh, these websites because, you know, they might add on more uh, fellowships and more countries. They always keep changing the list of hosts. So, but right now, this is the only surgical fellowships they offer. So, once you decide, you know, to do a fellowship abroad, the first thing that you need to do is sit down and map your mind, you know, just to streamline your thoughts. So you need to know the why, when, where, and with. So starting with the why, it should be very clear why you're doing this fellowship or why you want to do it. So for some, it may be because you want to do a niche subspecialty, which is not, which is not available in India. For example, it can be ocular uh, pathology, ocular genetics, um, pediatric cornea, and stuff like that. Um, the other uh, uh, the other reason why you want to do it may be because you want to make your name in the academic field and you want to uh, get research experience with some big names abroad. Uh, some may do it just for the experience, both the work experience and the life experience. Now, uh, settling abroad, yes, uh, fellowship uh, may be the initial steps to permanently settling outside, but this is a little beyond the scope of today's discussion. But we can uh, tackle some questions about it later when you have the interactive uh, part. But this should not be the primary reason for going outside. Something that can help you, you know, to decide if you at all want to do an international fellowship, should you do the fellowship, is doing a quick SWOT analysis. So write down your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this will be useful even when you apply because you might sometimes need to write an SOP or a cover letter. Mm -hmm. So for example, for your strengths, your strength can be something like uh, you have uh, 
particular research experience in that field already. So that might be lucrative to that uh, mentor or that university. Uh, next, your weaknesses. Um, for example, your weakness could be uh, maybe you did a VR fellowship, but you didn't get a lot of uh, exposure to ROP. And that is why you're applying to the fellowship to get more training in ROP. Um, next is opportunities. The opportunity could be something like opportunity to collaborate uh, with uh, other uh, stalwarts in their field. Uh, threats could be the finances because um, you know uh, you may not have the funds to apply outside. So immediately you know you can only apply to the fellowships which pay a stipend. So this will help you make a decision. Next, coming to when to do a fellowship. So first and foremost, you need to have do a little bit of advanced planning at least one to two years beforehand. Uh, because there, you need time to get the visa and a lot of other processes are involved. And there's often a waiting list also, especially in UK. For doing, for those who are interested in doing a clinical fellowship or even a clinical research fellowship, I would always recommend going there a post fellowship. That is after doing a primary fellowship in India, because a lot of universities outside prefer that. Or the other option is to go two to three years after you worked as a consultant in India. Why I say two to three years is because uh, they often prefer people less than 35 years of age. Post-residency, uh, it may be difficult to score a surgical uh, fellowship, uh, but you can get a research fellowship, especially in uh, uh, medical retina. Like I know people in Canada who have done their uh, DNB in India and gone there to do glaucoma or uh, medical retina fellowship directly without a primary fellowship. So it is possible, but it is rare. In the US, uh, it's possible uh, you can get uh, very good uh, research fellowships, uh, like basic science research fellowships, but usually they don't give clinical research fellowships without a prior fellowship. You can always go for an observership at any time. Uh, next, coming to where, that is, you know, the decision on in which country you will do your fellowship. Uh, a lot of factors are involved in taking this decision. Um, for example, uh, country. Some subspecialties may only be available in, a in only one country. For example, I think um, Canada is the only country in the world that uh, offers a pediatric uh, cornea fellowship. So that will limit your choice. Next, coming to uh, mentor. Um, your mentor may actually be the decisive factor for where you want to go. Uh, for example, um, um, Usually, you know, we don't consider Taiwan when we want to go for a fellowship. But for someone who's interested in ROP, you have uh, Dr. Wai Chi Wu in uh, ROP. Uh, he's a big name in ROP in Taiwan. And uh, in such a case, your mentor may be the reason of why you chose to go to a particular country. So like I said, a lot of factors come into play. So you have to take all that into account when you decide where you want to go. So let's look at the different countries. Um, Starting off with UK, um, the first thing you know that even as a fellow, you must, must have a GMC registration. Uh, for that, you will require an English language proficiency test, ILTS or OET. And along with that, you will need to have had given one of these exams, FRC Opt or FRCS or MRCS. Remember that the F MRCS Edinburgh that is uh, of awarded by the ICO, that is not accepted for GMC. So once you have your GMC registration, you can just go to nhs.jobs and find a suitable fellowship for yourself. Now, for those who have not, uh, who have not given any of these exams and they are not eligible for uh, getting GMC registration, they can apply through something called the dual sponsorship scheme. And in this case, the RCO, that is the Royal College, helps you get a GMC registration. So for the dual sponsorship, you need two sponsors. One is your... Um, local sponsor that's in India. It's usually that will be your mentor who uh, works in the subspecialty in which you are interested. And the other will be an international sponsor based in the UK. And usually uh, that will be someone whom your mentor probably knows and can put you, you know, in touch with. So once you fulfill all these eligibility criteria, it's uh, UK is a great place to be in. You have uh, you get quite a bit of hands on. You get a stipend, and uh, there's possibility to extend your fellowship also, because uh, you get uh, you have some options for tier two and tier five visas.
coming to the us now us uh, is difficult because uh, you don't get stipend and you don't get hands on so you have to be financially sound also because you don't get hands on i would recommend applying for uh, less hands on branches like pathology genetics neuro ophthalmology etc or medical retina and these are a few you have a few limited options available uh, i'll be giving or putting all this later in the handout also um the one uh, university that offers uh, clinical research fellowships in us is ucla you have one year fellowships in all sub specialties and it's better to apply through apao because you get uh, some funding at least and uh, from what i've read on the apao side they have fellowship reports from previous candidates so there's uh, someone from india who did an oculoplasty fellowship there and uh, she has been able to get some amount of surgical hands on also limited but uh, it this may be a good uh, university in us if you want to if you are set on doing it in us but remember again it's only 20% clinical and 80% of your time is still spent in research australia is uh, the only university i think that is offering now is sydney eye hospital earlier a lot of other hospitals also had fellowships but i think now sydney eye hospital offers one year fellowships and you can apply directly through the website you just need an english test you don't need any other licensing exam you have uh, very good hands on in fact uh, in vr fellowships from what i've heard in a year you can expect uh, anything uh, up to 400 uh, to 500 uh, vitrectomies and you get a good stipend also iofm also is currently offering a one year pediatric ophthalmology fellowship in australia singapore also is a good uh, especially singapore national eye center you can apply through ioff or apao Uh, directly i'm not sure because on the website uh, they say you can apply but they don't mention any uh, provision for stipend uh, you have to give toefl for uh, singapore and you have full surgical privilege uh, uh, no other exams needed now coming to canada of course uh, i did my fellowship from university of toronto and it's one of the top universities uh, in Ca in canada of course and also in the world and uh, the best part is you don't need any english exam you don't need any other exam you have full surgical privilege and you get a good stipend so all plus points in my opinion and uh, university of toronto offers uh, some sub specialties which are not offered anywhere else in the world like pediatric cornea and the famous gas fellowship which is glaucoma and uh, complex anterior segment surgery uh the other universities in canada also offer fellowships uh, but uh, you know their requirements uh, some of them sometimes don't pay stipend some of them require ilts so uh, in my opinion uft is the best uh, university to apply there now lastly you know with so you need a lot of things to take with you when you go for your fellowship uh, so let's look at the list of things that you would need to get in order before you apply first of all references you would need at least three good reference or recommendation letters um it could be uh, one of them could be your uh, residency director second could be your fellowship director and the third has to be someone ideally in the same sub specialty in which you are applying outside and uh, it's always preferred if that uh, your indian mentor uh, knows the preceptor abroad under whom you are applying or uh, and your indian mentor is also someone who is renowned in that specialty finances even if you are getting a fully funded uh, fully paid uh, fellowship you still need to have uh, your finances in order because a lot of uh, extraneous uh, fina uh, extraneous uh, fees are needed for visa license university charges insurance etc research you it's always good to have some publication and research in the same field if not you can have at least presentations and posters in conferences uh like i said before a previous fellowship is preferred in the same specialty or at least in related specialty for example i did ocular oncology now ocular oncology you it's not limited to retina you can apply from retina you can apply from cornea also you can apply i guess from oculoplasty also um credentials of course your cv needs to be excellent um 
uh, you need to, probably you would have done FICO. If you're applying to a particular country, uh, you, like US, you would need USMLE, other exams for UK. And of course, miscellaneous requirements like ECFMG certification, English test for some countries, GMC for the UK, SF match for US and stuff like that. So once you have all this ready, I think you are set to start with your application. Uh, but it's not just about, um, you know, improving your clinical skills. There are a lot of other things that you gain from doing a fellowship abroad. Uh, soft skills um, like interpersonal communication, I think is a big gain for uh, people, who, especially for us who trained in India. I feel this is something that is often neglected. Um, you learn how to have difficult conversations with people. Um, another soft skill that I learned is uh, leadership because I was selected there for a course which has been very helpful uh, for my own uh, professional growth. Of course, cultural experience is another thing that you gain from your fellowship. You get to work in a completely different culture with different people, often different race, different language. Uh, different beliefs and uh, they often have different different uh, disease profile also uh, networking yes um, you build a worldwide uh, network of people with whom you can collaborate in future personal growth is very important you know in often all of us we are used to work being done for us at home so when you move abroad to a different country all on your own uh, it's uh, it's you know it's uh, staying outside alone and doing everything on your own it helps you um, build become a more confident and uh, independent person and of course lastly bragging rights uh, you know it's another feather in your cap you can probably use it to leverage it uh, or you know have an edge over other people maybe in jobs I'm not sure if that works um and lastly, I think these are a few glimpses from my uh, fellowship in Canada. This is uh, me in the OR doing a brachytherapy here with my mentors. Um, this is on a laser day, uh, doing retinoblastoma lasers. This here, um, presenting a paper at U-Retina. Uh, so uh, uh, University of Toronto uh, sponsored the entire uh, international conference for me. Um, we also have uh, regular, you know, team dinners and uh, potluck where you have to cook for the whole department. Yeah. And this uh, this video here. So, uh, you, if you see this video, just a minute. I think my uh, cursor is stuck for some reason. Uh, I think my screen is just uh, hung for a bit. So just give me a moment to figure it out. Am I still audible? Because my screen doesn't seem to be moving. Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay. You are audible. Okay, Thank just you. I can see my own screen. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So in this, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a kind. This is actually a journal club that we had uh, beside the lake. Uh, we lit a bonfire and we were reading um, uh, controversial articles on retinoblastoma management. And the ones which uh, we debated them and the ones we didn't agree with, we threw in the into the fire. We roasted marshmallows in that. So, you know, it was a very unique uh, educational experience. And uh, this kind of approach, uh, I don't think I would have been able to experience anywhere else. This lady here in blue, she's actually one of the world's topmost names in retinoblastoma. She's Dr. Brenda Galli. And I think I'm very lucky to have been able to work with such people. Um, but remember, it's not always about work. You have Saturdays and Sundays uh, off there. So you do have a work-life balance and uh, I made the most of it. I traveled, went to a lot of beautiful places, experienced extremes of weather, uh, did hiking, uh, started playing board games. And of course, I made some lifelong uh, friendships. So um, don't hesitate. If you uh, want to do it, go ahead and apply. But don't, uh, you know, don't get worried. Even if you're unable to crack an international fellowship, you have some great uh, fellowships in India too. 
so with that i'll end my presentation uh, if you have any questions uh, you know we will be answering questions now of course but if you come up yeah. with anything later or you know if you need some contacts abroad or you can just uh, just scan this qr code and it will take you to my insta channel and you can always just message me there i do some educational videos and also stuff about fellowship there so you can just uh, reach me here so thank you for uh, listening to me and uh, best of luck uh, for uh, those who want to try uh, and you can again scan this for the handout uh, let me know if you want to me to keep the qr codes on the screen for a bit longer uh, i think uh, that's the end of my presentation or you can just take a screenshot actually and scan it later we'll we'll share it in the group uh... yeah yeah i can just give the qr code there i think okay so thank you all yeah so i think i think we can we can definitely see that what is uh, the the way the presentation and way you presented it it really shows that the differences you cannot point out it is the whole the attitude and the way of doing things changes once you are trained even for a, a short term or it's just the approach and not just as you said it is not just a clinical it is just a life changing yeah. this and so, and it is it is not oh, all work and no play because you you it is it is a overall and development development no, 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 so i think i think so that is very good now uh, my to dhyan also didn't go there generally people ask is uh, for a person who is in a medical college and uh, who has great mentors but their mentors are may not be renowned internationally or they are not so much into research work uh, how should they go about if someone is a senior resident or a, is how to get the recommendations like right yeah so um it's not uh, like i said uh, all the prerequisites that i said it's good if you have them but uh, you know at the end of the day all you need to do is to be able to convince the university that you really want to do it and that they'll gain something by taking you so all the requirements are not mandatory even if you are doing uh, you know your uh, ms or dnb in a medical college um uh, one way you can go about it is you know give your fic your exam and start off with a three month observership so the moment you are outside what happens is you make a lot of connections there and um, usually from what i've seen all the mentors they are very approachable and they can always even the mentors say the mentors you go for during your ico observership for three months they can put you in touch with uh, more uh, other people and uh, that is often um, helpful and uh, if that is not present you can always always apply through ioff for the one year fellowships now ico does not offer one year fellowships uh, which give clinical uh, experience but ioff does and uh, for them uh, you just need to fulfill the set of eligibility uh, criteria that they have on their site and uh, recommendation letter you know you can just give a letter from your uh, director uh, of uh, the medical college and uh, your uh, hod in ophthalmology and uh, maybe one other faculty that should be enough if you apply through ioff okay okay so that that's good so it doesn't you don't need to be in a really the best institute or a place under a best mentor and these days with the uh, social media and everyone is approachable and even in yes. conferences i think you can you can definitely build up uh, yes, second yes. question which uh, uh, residents do ask is about this cover letter so so what does it mean and uh, can you just uh, put some yeah. so cover letter is usually not uh, like um, needed in all universities i would say but think of it as more like your first contact with uh the mentor like uh, for example say even if you want to apply through ico or ioff or uh, through some other organization like apao you they would always need you to contact your host first to check their availability so your first letter or your first email to the host 
gives them the impression about you so that is kind of the cover letter so you write a write a little bit about yourself um about your previous experience why you want to do the fellowship usually they don't ask for a separate cover letter lit later on from what i have seen okay so i think we have few questions uh, those who are putting questions in the chat i think can directly use the mic and uh, so that uh, dr advita can understand the questions better okay which fellowships and country is good for we are good evening sir yeah yeah go ahead yeah yeah whoever was on please go ahead uh good evening sir good evening uh, dr advaita i am uh, dr advaita here actually i wanted to know is there any uh, ico fellowship the three month fellowships that could have a surgical exposure in vr or those are usually the observerships for medical retina yeah no you can definitely get an ico fellowship uh, for three months in vr but uh, as far as i know that's not going to give you any surgical exposure like you can observe surgeries uh, probably they will let you assist in surgeries and you can see all the steps and but they won't let you operate okay okay thank you hello yes doctor yeah. please uh, thank you sir uh, good evening madam and sir uh, my question was uh, which we are uh, fellowship would you like to recommend us and which country is better appropriate for doing well a vr fellowship in term of surgical on hands and uh, other stipend type of uh, things thank you uh, well uh, first of all i think um, you also need to know why you want to do a vr fellowship outside um, can i ask you if you like because uh, like i said a vr fellowship i am assuming you want a surgical vr fellowship and uh, usually the surgical fellowships abroad they will not take you without a primary uh, vr fellowship in india already so the first question that you want to ask yourself is after doing a two year uh, vr fellowship in india would i want to do another vr fellowship outside or not if you are settled want to settle outside yes that's a perfectly valid reason but uh, so that is one question that you need to be clear about but if you still want to do it just to get experience um, like i said um, you can get a surgical vr fellowship in uh, uk canada singapore and australia now from what i know um australia you can go after you've done your primary vr fellowship in india they prefer that and uh, it gives very good hands on um from uh, someone who did it there i've heard they give 400 vitrectomies in a year which is much more than uh, i think i get i got uh, so australia is a good option uh, canada um, yes canada is also a very good option one of my friends has done a two year vr fellowship from st michael's hospital in canada canada also gives you a lot of hands on in vr um but sometimes what may happen is because the canadian residents also apply to such fellowships you may need to start off by doing a medical retina fellowship or a one year research fellowship and then you make your network and connections and then you go into vr because vr is very high demand in north america um uk is of course if you have gmc registration and you are able to get a vr fellowship uh, very good but uh, most of my friends have usually done uh, from what i hear the medical retina fellowship and then there is something called a lateral entry into vr again so the only place where you can directly go into vr i think is uh, Australia and yes, also Singapore to uh, some extent. Uh, Ma'am, what about if we are doing as a primary uh, post fellowship? For example, just after completing the residency, if we are um, uh, thinking to do a primary fellowship abroad, so is it difficult to get that? Uh, in VR, yes, yes, you can get it. Uh, in uh, less uh, surgical lines, uh, medical retina. um i have uh, i know someone who went after dnb directly to canada to do glaucoma you can get it in other uh, very uh, niche lines like pathology and ocular genetics and but uh, usually vr uh, it will be difficult to get a vr fellowship with hands on uh, without doing one in your own country because you know they they at the end of the day they want to teach you but they also need someone to see patients 
and to operate so they will prefer someone who knows the basics who has done the steps and they will help you hone your craft they will help you tell uh, they will teach you each step again in australia but uh, still they want you to be someone who already knows the basics of vr surgery i think dr adnan is not from india can you just uh, let us know dr adnan uh, you're from which place uh -huh. Uh, yes, sir. I am basically from Pakistan. Okay. okay. Right. Great. Right, right. Right. Thank you, madam, so, for your answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, anyone else? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, sir and ma'am, my question is, uh, post-residency, if I want to directly apply for a clinical fellowship, how important is surgical uh, experience? Do the number of cases that I've done in residency matter or, uh, you know, will the training be initiated all over again if I apply for an international fellowship? Um, so, you... Uh, sorry, I just need to understand your question a little bit better. So you want to apply to a surgical fellowship after residency or a clinic, yes. like okay. uh, a surgical fellowship? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. So like I said, uh, okay. it's difficult to get a surgical fellowship immediately no, after no, residency no, no, unless no, no. unless you're uh, really, um, you know, um, you know, say, for example, you have uh, plans to you have uh, plans to move and settle in the US. Uh, so in that case, uh, and maybe you've done US MLE one and two. So if you have passed US MLE one and two, you can get fellowships uh, there. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it will be difficult to get anything after residency. Uh, even in uh, no, even in countries like Canada, um, Singapore, UK, um, it's difficult to go directly into a surgical fellowship without a prior fellowship in India. Okay. Because they have all, all their own residents applying, so there will be, uh, they will not want to take someone whom they have to teach all the basic things again. Usually, that's the way it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, good evening, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Uh, what? At how important is it to clear these exams like FRC of Prague or FRCS for that matter? If you are planning to apply for a fellowship after finishing a primary fellowship in India, how relevant is it, and what would be the right time to actually give it? Because after uh, doing a primary fellowship. Uh, again, reading everything, reading all specialities and everything might be difficult for a lot of people. So is it advisable to finish that during residency and maybe go ahead with the primary fellowship in India and then maybe apply for something else outside India after the primary fellowship is done? How important is it and how would you recommend to go about it? Yeah, so first of all, the, you need to give these exams only if you want to uh, go to the UK. Like you, you're, you're, if you're talking about FRC opt and FRCS, uh, then the only place where you will need it is if you're planning that you will do a fellowship from the UK. And uh, even in the UK, if you've not given these exams, there is a way to do the fellowship. And that is through the dual sponsorship scheme uh, in which you get a local mentor and a UK mentor. But uh, the other countries, uh, you know, you don't need to give uh, any exams. So you can apply there directly without uh, sitting for any of these exams. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else? So we have some in the chat, I feel. Uh, could you give an idea about average fund needed to the fellowship? Yes, that's a very valid question. Okay. Yeah, that is actually a difficult question. Um, it depends, of course, if you're going into it, depending on which country you're going to. Um, so, of course, if it's a non-funded fellowship like the US where there is no stipend, it's a huge amount. And uh, I have not actually gone and calculated that. That was actually one of the reasons why uh, I chose to do it uh, in, the, in Canada rather than US. But uh, it's quite a bit because even apart from your fellowship fees, they need to they need you when you apply for the visa you need to show say around at least forty thousand dollars just you know to the show that you have the living expenses you have the ability to support yourself 
uh, the ability to get insurance. So in US, uh, 40,000 US dollars is just something you have to show in your bank. And this is separate from the amount you will need for the fellowship or to live. Um, Canada, uh, I think um, the, uh, the stipend that uh, the University of Toronto pays, it was good enough for me to sustain. I went there alone. So it was good enough for me to sustain myself on that stipend without taking anything from India. Uh, there was like a few extra fees, like um, say I would say uh, it would come down to maybe 3,000, 4,000 Canadian dollars over uh, two years including university charges, but then you get a very good amount of tax. Um, like you're basically an employee in Canada. So each year you get $3,000, $4,000 and even more, you get as tax refund. So in the end, uh, in Canada, you're, uh, you can also save money. So we, we are roughly talking about five to 10 lakhs. In Indian currency, I was just trying to convert what you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because because yeah. It, uh, like uh, it 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 has to be a very informed decision and uh, yes, yes. And has to so be... usually in ophthalmology, the stipend that they give is around fifty thousand to sixty thousand Canadian dollars a year. So that will come down to like if the. 50,000, um, so that will be, I think the trans, uh, the rate is around 60 Canadian dollars to uh, 60 rupees to one Canadian dollars right now, conversion rate. So. Okay, I think I think that, that helps. So at least we have to have a backup. And as you said, for the it is just for the visa also you need that. Yes. So if... maybe I think maybe for the initial, like if you go for a paid fellowship, at least for the initial two or three months till you know you get all your logistics, get insurance, everything done, you start getting stipend from the university. You need to take living expenses for the first couple of months. And after that, I think you can sustain yourself quite well and even save some money. Right. And then, then locally, you come to know like how and yeah. what, how yeah. it's managed. Yeah, so a, a good thing is health insurance is completely free. So any, you're sick, you buy medicines in Canada, all that is uh, by the government. So, uh, and uh, so that's a plus. Okay. So, uh, hi. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, uh, I would like to know with uh, just a diploma and a two-year uh, VR fellowship in India, will be sufficient for applying in uh, countries like Australia and Canada or uh, PNB or uh, MS is mandatory? Uh, no, um, it's not mandatory. Um, you can apply to Australia because you already have done a fellowship and uh, like in any case, they don't require any... Um, uh, they don't have any eligibility stating that you need this Indian degree. You just need to have done a residency and a specialty training, which uh, even if you've done a diploma, you have. so technically you should be able to be eligible. As long as you know you have a good uh, CV and you can put forth your case, you should be good. Thank you. Okay, so anyone else? Dr. Komal, would you like to ask? Okay. So yeah, this is a question which we are getting in the chat box. Is, right. uh, is there any age bar? Okay, yeah, I think uh, the age bar is about uh, 40 for uh, IOFF and ICO fellowships. And like I said, uh, they do prefer uh, younger, like uh, 35 and below even for like some of the APAO grants and stuff like that. But 40, I think, is the cutoff limit. Even for direct uh, application, they will have a... No, like um, for observerships, uh, there is no age bar as far as I know, neither for direct uh, application. Like if, 
say someone cracks uh, has a gmc registration and you apply directly to uk and you get a job there no one can uh, like the age does not matter in that case Oh. and um, yeah if this is only even if you are applying in canada you are applying directly to the university so they don't have any age bar this is only if you are applying through co or iuff for okay. the funded fellowships and i think now even aios is uh, having some at these observerships i don't know if anyone has done them but that's what we okay. see on their right right okay i wasn't aware good so anyone has experience with applying to ioff and which countries have the highest chances uh, would you like to take that edi dipta edi dipta so bicho bhi road mein phone pe chal rahe ho to yeah so so i have uh, like uh, in the handout i have given the a list of Uh, the IOFF website, so they have one entire page of the hosts, and they have a long list of hosts which you can uh, filter according to your country of choice or specialty of choice. Uh, so I personally don't know um, whether uh, any countries uh, have preference. I think uh, the only thing I know they do give preference to is, like I said, IOFF has clearly mentioned on their site that they give preference to. females young females less than 40 from developing countries so maybe a female might have a better chance through ioff but country wise preference i'm not sure but ioff uh, i have emailed with them corresponded with them a few times and they are very uh, prompt at replying back so you can always just throw them a shoot them an email and that should be good i think we have we answered uh, most of the queries if if uh, if we are done then i think we can let dr adwaita relax she she has been kind enough to take all the questions and um, i think you can just uh, share the uh, this uh, the uh, handout we will be sharing with uh, yeah it will be shared in the group and mm -hmm. we will try to upload this video on the youtube so you can you can again scan through that and uh, if if uh, anyone has any other question before we sign off then uh, please go ahead otherwise i think uh, it's it's really been great session and hello uh, yeah please go ahead huh. uh i was asking that uh, when is the ideal time to appear for uh, frco or frc opta during so, residency or post residency uh, when is the ideal time uh frc of the i think it's best to give it as you are going through residency or you know just in the you know because of course it also uh, at the most i would say up to one year after residency that's the time you are most fresh with all the knowledge and all the facts you have everything on your the tips of your fingers so i think that is the best time to sit for these exams but they are not mandatory unless you are going to the uk it won't uh, give you any edge as such if you are planning to settle down in india okay i think i think that uh, yeah, that is a very important point that unless you are you are sure for uk then uh, going for frc opt or frcs may is not mandatory and uh, it's it's just if yeah you are interested then make sense but it is not uh, a route through which your international career will take place and in, uh, like previously also we discussed in india it doesn't add on to your uh, it adds on to your cv when you show it to your colleagues but it doesn't weigh you for your jobs or uh maybe even not for your fellowship so so and frc opt i think it it has quite a few exams so it is a little longer journey so the earlier the better and what is the youtube page on which you are going to share this this is clinical peanuts okay thank you okay so i think i think that it's been really great session
Dr. Advaita and, and uh, I have been after uh, Dr. Advaita for quite some time to have this session because uh, this is like uh, one topic which uh, is like really we don't have much information and uh, it, it is really kind of you to actually share your experience because generally what happens is people somehow don't share it and they are not very open about it and how and why and this. So you have covered all the parts like why and even why you shouldn't so so it's it's like if you get an opportunity take it if you feel that your uh, the finances are little yeah then you may postpone it or even if you may cancel it but uh, definitely it adds on to you and if you're not going uh you shouldn't feel down about it because uh, it at times you may not be losing a lot if you're uh, you can have the same experience if if you are from India or wherever you are in those places, also we have great institutes. So so keep trying and and uh, if anything, uh, you can always get in touch with Doctor Advaita. Yeah, for sure. And uh, Doctor Anuj, thank you so much for uh, you know uh, asking me to take this class, uh, and uh, it was a good experience for me. Okay, so we'll we'll sign out and I'll try to upload this session on uh, YouTube. And once it's done, I'll just update every one of you. Okay, Th thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks. Thank you and good night. Okay. Yeah.